Hey guys, are you wondering what is going on in your wife's mind when she tells you she's thinking about nothing? Maybe she's wondering what goes on in your mind when you tell her you're thinking about nothing. Does fine really mean fine when you ask your wife how she's doing? Find out the answer to these questions on today's episode. Man the Arena Army, I salute you. Hey guys, thanks for listening to this episode of the Men of the Arena podcast, Spotify's number one podcast for Christian men. I'm Jim Ramos, your guide and host for this show, leading you to your best version inside that stress bubble of life and beyond. Guys, I want to jump on into our hero story. As you know, we are looking for 365 hero stories this year to celebrate the transformative power of Jesus Christ in your life. And so this one is number 10, comes to us from Tom on Instagram. And Tom writes, this ministry is needed for me and all men. Keep crushing it. The last podcast with Bill Newton was so dang good. The takeaways from the podcast filled two pages of notes. Again, Keep moving forward, men in the arena. It matters. Tom, thanks so much, man. We are blessed. Make sure you hit us up at info at menintherena.org. Shoot us your physical address so we can send you some swag. Hey, guys, stay tuned to the end of this podcast episode for this week's Man Law. You're going to love it. Today, I want to welcome our guest on the show, Bill Farrell. Bill is an international speaker, relationship expert, and author of over 35 books, including the best selling Men Are Like Waffles. Women Are Like Spaghetti, which is our subject for today. He and his wife, Pam, have co-hosted radio programs as well as co-authored numerous books to encourage and enhance interpersonal relationships. Bill is a seminar and conference speaker and frequent guest on radio and television and podcasts just like this. Hey, guys, I am so excited to have Bill on the show today. I read his book, Men Are Like Waffles, Women Are Like Spaghetti, years ago, and I've been waiting and waiting to get him on the show. Guys, this is going to change your marriage. I'm absolutely convinced of it. So, hey, Bill, welcome on the show, brother. It's great to have you on again. Thank you, Jim. It is always good to be with you. Yeah, I think we had yeah. you on and we went over Red Hot Monogamy. So yeah, we'll, which, we'll have that. Yeah. Which, of course, is one of my favorite books. And the research on the book was awesome. Yeah, I really, really like that book. And actually, the <laughs> funny part is, I didn't realize you wrote Men Are Like Waffles, Women Are Like Spaghetti till after. But to me, you know, that that book was impactful for me uh, on a on a personal level. So why don't you walk us through this? Uh, why why the title? Why'd you why the title of that book? So I, I think the best way to tell you the why the title is to tell you the story of how it came together. Because my my wife and I, we had been working with couples like we both grew up in crazy homes When we got married, we had no idea how to be married. And I was like most of the guys probably in your audience that when I married Pam, I thought I was where I was marrying a buddy that looked way better than all my guy friends. (laughs) Yep. And and then I got married and realized I had married a woman. And I had to start learning. How do you do that? How do you relate to a female? How do you develop a relationship where both of you are getting equal say and both of your needs are being addressed and. And, and like, we had to do a bunch of research. I even quoted a bunch of couples at church and said, and you guys look like you're doing okay. Like, how do you do this? And so we started, we started helping people figure out how to do marriage, how to do a relationship, how to communicate. But I had this thought in the back of my mind, we have got to be guy friendly mm-hmm. with how we describe marriage. Because getting women to talk about relationships is a lot like fishing at the hatchery. Like, it's just really easy. <laughs> Yep. But getting men to engage is it's a whole different deal. So so we've been doing research about how men and women think different and how they communicate different, how they relieve stress different. But I didn't have a good way to present it. And I was helping out with the youth basketball league at our at our uh, town. And this guy walked up to me one day and he said, hey, Bill, you're a pastor, right? And I went, well, yes. He goes, do you ever meet with couples? I said, well, Yeah. He goes, okay, good. I want to bring my wife in because I think she's broken. Now I'm really, I'm really intrigued because one, a man is initiating this. Yes. And second, I want to know what he means by his wife's broken. And they came to my office and they sat down. And this this lady that he was married to, like I know that women have more words to work with every day than men do, but 
Like this lady was a superstar. She like is in the top 2% of women who can talk. So he looked at her and went, go ahead. And she started talking like on cue. She just started talking. And while he's taught, while she's talking, he looks at me and says, she does this all the time. Like, I think something's <laughs> wrong with her. Like something's broken with her. Oh man. And it was one of those moments, Jim, where all the research thinking guy friendly, the thought in my head was men like food. And it just hit me. I said, Hey, look, think about your wife's conversation, like a plate of spaghetti. There's a bunch of noodles on the plate. And she has to go through and touch every noodle on the plate until she's done with this conversation. So just let her go from subject to subject to subject because every one of those noodles touch each other. So she can seamlessly move from one subject to another to another and just let her roll through her plate of spaghetti. And he went, uh, OK. And he just sat back and listened to her. And she talked for 55 minutes. And, and she finished, and he looked at me. He goes, what do I do now? I said, nothing. <laughs> Just thank her for sharing. Don't do anything. So he did, and she sat back in her chair, and she went, wow, I, I feel better right now than I have in a long time. So if I'm like spaghetti, what's he like? Oh. And I said, well, we're out of time for today. So let's get together in a couple of weeks, and I'll, I'll tell you. Because, you know, it all just came together in the moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I left that meeting. I said, God, I have two weeks. I need a food analogy that describes how men process life. And my boys were making toaster waffles one day. And I went, I think that might work. Yes. So I went back to this couple and I said, okay, now here's how us men operate. We, our, our mind looks like the top of a waffle. Yeah. There's a bunch of boxes. All those boxes are separated from one another by walls. And the way we as men operate is the first issue in life goes in the first box. Second box goes in the second box. Third box goes in the third we, we do one box at a time and one box only. So like when your husband's at work, he is at work. And when your husband is in the yard doing yard work, he is in the yard doing yard work. One subject at a time. So then I looked at this guy and I said, now it's your turn to talk today. Is there a subject you want to bring up? And he said, yeah, there is. So I told the wife, you cannot change subjects. Whatever subject he brings up, he wants to stay on that subject. So you cannot bring up any other subjects. And I knew she couldn't do it. So I was going to have to play the police that day. <laughs> and I stopped her six times. I said, write that down. You can talk about that later. Write down. You can talk about that later. And they solved an issue in my office that day that he'd been trying to talk to her about for months. And I went, wow. I think I got something here. Yes. So I went home and told my wife, I said, Pam, I think I got something. And I want us to try it out at a seminar we're doing this Friday. And I explained it all to her and she went, well, it sounds kind of corny, but I trust you and I trust God. So let's go for it. And we tried it out at this seminar because it was small. Because, you know, sometimes you have an idea and you don't know it's going to fly yeah. or it's going to die. So it, it was just a small group, but we we launched it there and it ignited the whole group. And I especially got their attention when I, I told the ladies, I said, no, ladies. Every man has a few boxes on his waffle that are absolutely blank. There are yes. no thoughts. There are no words. And we as men park in these boxes. So when you ask us, what are you thinking? And we say nothing. We're telling you the truth. Yes. <laughs> and we get really stressed when you say, you can't be thinking nothing. You have to be thinking something. So what is it? And I tell ladies, ladies, no, if we can think nothing. And we didn't know it was a problem until we met you. Yes. Because we've been doing this since we were little boys. <laughs> and all the men in the group erupted. And I realized, okay, we got to run with this. And what I've discovered is we it gives people words to describe something they know is already going on. Yep. But don't know how to describe it. That is so, well, you know, it's really interesting because I, because my wife to this day will say, what are you doing? Nothing. Are you in your nothing box? I'm up. I am. Are you in your hunting box? So we use this all yeah. the time. But what what hit me? Let me let me just throw a curveball here as I'm yeah. processing out loud and thinking of my own marriage. What if that waffle? You know, you pour syrup on that waffle and it kind of layers through the boxes. But as a little kid, I would try to pull the walls off the you know, and kind of combine boxes. <laughs> right. But as a man, when that happens, I get extremely overwhelmed. Does yeah. that make sense to you? 
Well, because we separate everything out, our basic approach to life is we solve problems. So we go to yes. a box, we figure out if there's a problem. If there is, we want to solve it and move on. And every man has a capacity on how many problems they can have open at a time. Yes. So you might get two or three open and you're fine. You might even get four open and you're fine. You get to five and now you're overwhelmed and you just shut down. Yes. And every man, like, like every man's capacity is different. But every man goes through that process where if we get too many problems open, we it's like the flood came in and we just shut down. It's not that we're not interested. It's that we're drowning. And yeah. and our wives have a hard time. I, our daughters, too, have a hard time just accepting it because they don't separate things out like that. They connect everything together. Yeah. And then they work out solutions. And when we do that, we just feel so overwhelmed that we, we don't think any of it's worth working on. So, you know, as we mature, we can get maybe two or three boxes open at once. But if we go beyond that, we just shut down. Yeah, absolutely. And so I want to, uh, guys, this is so important. I mean, this has been a game changer for my marriage. We've been married 30 years, and I think we learned of this stuff maybe 10 years ago, and it was a, a game changer for us. So I do appreciate yeah. this on a on a personal level. And so now you talked about men getting overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And in your book, you, you said that, you know, when it comes to stress, this is a quote from your book, men retreat to their easy boxes. So can sure. you explain this, this retreat and how that plays out in practical life with men when they get uh, overwhelmed or when they experience stress on a deep level? Sure. Well, again, as men, we were designed to produce. So as men, we will get into a productive box and we will get after it. Yes. And, and and you will see a man, he gets totally focused. He gets zeroed in. And that man can accomplish an incredible amount of stuff. And, and then he will reach a limit where he's feeling stress. And in order for men to relieve that stress, they have to get recharged. It's a lot like a battery. If you, if you run down a battery, you got to put that battery in a recharger and if you let it stay in that recharger for long enough, it powers back up and then it's ready to go. And that's how we as men have been wired is we can we can push like crazy. We can focus like crazy. And then we need to go to some place where we can recharge. And every man's got easy boxes. Yes. Like for some men, it's a sports box. For some men, it's a hunting box. For some, it's a fishing box. For some, it's a technology box. But every man's got easy boxes he can go to where when he spends time there, he gets recharged. And if, if we aren't careful as men, like if we don't plan in our recharging moments, we actually run down. That we will just keep giving, keep giving, keep giving, keep giving, and then just wear out. And that's why, you know, we hear lots of stories of men that they were doing great, and then they just, they just quit. They quit on their families. They quit on yeah. their influence. It isn't that they're bad guys. It's they got totally overwhelmed. And their life didn't allow them to ever just stop and recharge. And then our families put pressure on us, too, because our wives don't really stress this way. The way our wives, the way our wives relieve stress is they talk through everything and connect everything. And so, so when our wives, like, like I like to tell men that when stress hits a woman's life, it's like a great big meatball comes flying out of the sky and it lands on her plate of spaghetti. And it sends noodles flying everywhere. So she has to go gather up all those noodles and get them back on the plate. And now she's got to integrate the meatball. Mm -hmm. So yep. she wants to look at everything that has to do with that stressful event. So she wants to talk it through and ask questions like, why did God bring this into my life? What does it say about you? What does it say about me? What does it say about us? How are we supposed to respond? And the first time through, it kind of connects, but not really. So then she wants to talk through it all again. And the second time through, it's getting a little bit better. But then she wants to talk through it a third time. And by then, as men, we're like blowing a gasket and thinking, we already talked about this. Why are we bringing it up again? Well, So our wives connect everything together, which will cause us to get overwhelmed. So when, when our wives see us under stress, they want to talk to us. Because they think if we talk through all of it and connect all of it, that we'll be doing better. And they don't realize they're piling on and making us feel even more stressed than when we started. So smart couples learn how to take turns relieving stress. 
that, that when we see our wives ramping up, we give them time to process. And when they see us ramping up, they give us time to go get in an easy box for a while. And as men, we can be responsible with it by actually putting it in our calendars and announce it ahead of time so that everybody in your circle of influence knows how important this is. Wow. Well, you know, there's so much here. I'm trying to put it all into one question. So we have, you know, our this podcast targets men, men who are in the stress bubble of life, raising kids, married. But let's address the women real quick because we've got a ton of women listening. What would you say? And this is a typical scenario. Uh, there's a there's tension in the relationship. He needs to. He's overwhelmed. He retreats into his nothing uh, box or his his man cave. So mm-hmm. he retreats into a physical place. And then she, with her drive to connect, because in your book, you said, quote, your wife is driven to connect because she's aware of all the issues in her life. So she wants to deal with that. So she literally will physically chase him into his empty box or his his man cave. What would you say to the wife who's like, my husband won't talk, he won't connect when we have an issue? What would you say to that wife who will not relent when her husband's trying to escape into his empty space? I'm going to assume, Jim, that this is a friendly question that the wife actually wants to hear yes. the answer rather than fight for territory. Ah. So uh, assuming that, what I would tell her is it's it's much more strategic for you to ask your husband, when can we get together and talk, rather than say, we need to talk. Because the other thing that happens here, when stress, especially when it hits a family, the men actually feel the stress at a deeper level than the women do. Mm-hmm. But we don't think they do because men get men get emotionally flooded and push it down. They don't emote it like our wives do. So if your husband is heading to that box, he's probably deeply concerned for the relationship and for the family. But he's not at a place yet where he can check. So if if you ask him when, rather than put pressure on him to talk now, you're going to be much more strategic. And I would say to the men, if your wife is brave enough and wise enough to ask, when can we talk, give her a time. Put it on the calendar, treat it like it's a business appointment, and have the discussion with your wife. Because by then you'll be prepared. Because when men have time to prepare, we do really well at these discussions. Yes. If we don't have time to prepare, that we we get blindsided and we panic and then we start defending ourselves. So we'll be ready to talk and your wife will get to talk things through. She'll be easier to live with. You'll be easier to live with. And you'll, you'll have brought stress down. That is such a powerful statement. And, you know, I because in my ministry, I do work with a lot of men and a lot of couples and that's one of the things that seems to be thematic. Yeah. It's this, I want to connect, but he won't connect. He runs and hides. But then he yeah. says, well, I want to connect, but you're pushing me. And so this when question, yeah. a, a, a seasoned wife who really understands her husband, seems like that when question really opens him up to, to step into where he's more comfortable, which is this problem solving and, and having a conversation where he can mentally prepare for it. Is that what you think? Yeah, I'd, I'd even go a step farther, and I would say that one of the keys to marriage is learning to take turns. Ooh, yeah. Because like for the men out there, when your wife wants to talk to you, she wants to connect her life to you. She wants to tell you what she's thinking, what she's feeling, what she did, what she thought about doing it, didn't do, what her mom thought about it, what her sister said about it, how she would do it next time. And she isn't necessarily looking for input in all those things. She's trying to get her life connected to you because when she has enough of her life connected to you, you actually turn into a trustworthy person in her life. So she's constantly trying to connect her life to you because it keeps trust alive. Now, that's not how we as men approach things. Yeah. Like when a man wants to talk to a woman, he wants to succeed at something. So there's something I want to talk to you about. I want to know that I can succeed in the conversation. And I want to know that if I give input, you're going to respect that input, listen to the input, and help me to evaluate the input. If you change subjects too fast, you head off in other directions, you criticize me, 
for what I said, a man will conclude I cannot succeed in this environment and he will back himself out. Because men don't like to be in environments where they can't succeed. Mm. And, and if wives can be sensitive to that, that when it's his turn to talk, we need to help him succeed. When it's her turn to talk, we need to help her connect. And if 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 men and women can take turns doing that, the relationship just keeps growing. Mm -hmm. But if you compete, are we connecting or are we succeeding? You compete over those two things, then men will go into a highly competitive mode. And that's not real good for marriage when you're competing with your wife. No, competition is good in business. Competition is great in athletics. It's not so good in marriage. Not at all. So just to rephrase this. So we're talking about the spaghetti analogy. My wife is like spaghetti. So when she is trying to connect with me, where would you put the man on that plate? Is he like the sauce? I mean, because she's trying to have multiple connection points with him. And the more she has, the deeper she trusts. So what word picture could you give a guy when his wife is this big pile of spaghetti? Actually, what I would tell men is the picture you want to keep in your head is that you're taking a walk with your wife around the edge of the plate. Oh, you're not diving into the spaghetti and getting all enmeshed in that. You're just taking a walk around. So she can say, look at that and look at that and look at that and look at that. Oh. And once you've taken the once you've taken the lap around the plate, she's going to go, thank you for being involved. And and like as men, it blows our mind like we didn't do anything. Like I didn't give any advice. I didn't comment on anything. I just like went, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, it's fascinating. And we just listened to you. And, and really, I did something? And she's like, yeah, thank you. And, and as men, we just like, you know, we don't get it naturally. We have to we have to learn this skill. So it's, it's kind of like taking a walk with your wife. Like if you took a walk with your wife around the neighborhood, you wouldn't get back to the house and say, okay, what, what did you see while we walked? How many trees did you see? How many bushes did you see? Did you see? Where, you, you just took a walk. And that's the way our wives often communicate with us. They just want us to go on a verbal, emotional walk with them. So you're just going around the edge of the plate until she's done pointing everything out. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to. I hope I don't put your marriage in trouble because I'm thinking of mine right now. Going, you know, when my wife takes me with on a walk around the spaghetti, which she did this morning, right? She's a flight attendant, awesome. so that's I'm leaving great. for a men's conference tomorrow. She came in last night. So we just laid laid in the bed this morning, just talked. And what we I made her breakfast and coffee, and basically we talked. Meant she talked. So yeah. I've learned there are key phrases that I say to her as I'm walking around the plate. And so, what are some key phrases and words you use? So before I give you the phrases, <laughs> let me give you the principle. Okay. The key to succeeding is to show curiosity. Yes. So I say that's fascinating. Uh huh. I'm sorry that happened you... to you. Can you tell me more about that? And how did you respond? <laughs> uh, how about that? Must have been so hard. That's a good one. <laughs> I'm sorry you feel that way. I mean, yep. it's, it's a, but I mean, and I'm not mocking our wives. I'm no. just saying uh, what I when I say to my wife that must have been hard, honey. Then it's just it gives her. Per, it's like a springboard for her. She launches. And right. then when she finishes, I make another statement to her and it's not, yeah. and I'm, and it's because I love her, right? Right. Because everything in, in me is wanting to solve the problem. Right. And, and we shouldn't, like, we shouldn't think of this as all that weird or strange because you put a group of guys in a sporting event, they're hitting each other, high-fiving one another, screaming and yelling. It doesn't sound like it has any real content. Yeah. We're just interacting. And this is the marriage version of that. Like, like when you're showing curiosity, you're high fiving your wife. Yes. And, and you're yeah. And our wives thrive on curiosity. And, and I tell men all the time: stop trying to understand your wife and just start accepting her. Yeah, that's important. And, yeah, when you accept her with fascination, because you're never going to understand her. Like she's yeah. wired differently than you. She sees life different than you. You married what you don't have. So acceptance is way more powerful than understanding. And if you need a Bible verse, Romans 15, 7 says, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. 
Yeah. And and for those really intellectual men out there, there are some like, like like there are some scientific reasons why this all works. Like like when when men and women talk and they need to solve a problem, men men will stay on one side of the brain to solve yes. the problem. So they're either bringing a logical answer or a creative answer, and they can move back and forth in their brain really quickly on the same side of the brain. And when women solve that problem, they use both sides of their brain at the same time. And the reason for that is there are more connections between the female sides of the brain than there are male. Because when men are in the, in the womb, there's a testosterone bath that takes place, yep. severs some of the connections between the two sides of the brain. And it sends a signal out for other connections not to develop. And and most women misinterpret this. They think, see, they're handicapped. And I tell women all the time, no, they're not handicapped. We just simplified the problem. Because studies show men and women solve problems equally well. They oh. just do it differently. Oh, okay. I did not know that. All right. Yeah. So So women will connect every thought to an emotion. Men will narrow it down. It's either a logical solution or it's a creative solution. And they both can get there. They just get there differently. And then when men and women share a meal, when men eat, the part of their brain that makes them happier gets stimulated. So a man is literally happier with himself, happier with life, and happier with his marriage right after he's eaten a, a meal. Women, when they eat the same meal, the part of their brain that sharpens their eyesight gets stimulated. And they become more aware of their environment and they have lots to talk about. So women have more to talk about. Men are more content and listen better, which is why so many good relationship memories happen around food. So it should actually be part of our strategy to build our marriage that we share meals together. And it extends to the family. Families that eat together really do have better relationships than ones who just eat on their own because we're wired by our creator that food and relationships go together and it's a wow. physical wire. <laughs> well, that's it. So the best way to a man's heart is through his stomach. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we did family breakfast with our kids, I, I, honestly, from the time they could walk. I mean, it, it, for, for, yeah. dec- for two decades. And I'll tell you what, that was, and it was not always pretty. I'll be honest with you. You got right. three boys in the house with a husband and your wife. It got a little bit loud at times, you know, but um, <laughs> yeah. that's a game changer. <laughs> It was a yeah. game changer. So now I, I, you know, I, I had operated under the assumption that men were better and more focused problem solvers, but that is not true is what you're saying. No, they just get there different. Oh, wow. And, what? and see for men, problem solving is the starting point and we'll move from there to emotionally connecting for women. Emotionally connecting is the starting point and they'll move from there to the solving the problem. And you meet in the middle. Hopefully. Yeah. Well, I have found that with my wife, for example, when my wife and I go on a trip, I'm the driver and I know where I'm going and I'm going to get there. And then she charts the way there. And that's, okay. that's really how we solve our problems because yeah. I, she will notice. And, and not only that, but in my ministry, I have, I have, uh, most of my staff are women, uh, all but okay. one, uh, okay. in my, when I plan an event, they're mostly women because they see things I don't see as yeah. we move down the common yeah. path. Right. Yeah. So, man. Absolutely. And, okay, and, and like just to reinforce what you said, like like if you go to a typical church, it has been built by men and decorated by women. Yeah, yeah, and and that's right in line with what God has done. Like like men, men are adventurers and they're conquerors and they're builders. And from the very beginning of creation, women make things better. So in the book of Genesis, everything was good until Eve showed up, and then it went to very good. Very good. Yep. And it is in the heart of women to make things better. Yeah. So so if we put those together, you know, if we bring our adventure in life and we tie it to something that makes things better, the product's way better if we can learn to cooperate. So do you think that a lot of a man's feeling that his wife is nagging him is because she wants to connect on a deeper level and he's not willing to, or is it because she sees something in him that he does not see in himself and she's unrelenting and getting him there? So, so let's just be very honest about this whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. But like both men and women 
have a relentless drive in, inside of them. Yes. That men have to deal with their sex drive, which is relentless. And we we have no idea how to turn it off. We're either going to focus it for good, or we're going to focus it, cause damage. What, there's kind of no in between. And if you tell a man, just hey, just calm down and stop. It doesn't work because men have to know what to do with all this passion that rolls inside of them. Women have a tenacious drive to make things better. Yes. And it's got to be hard to live with because everything in life can be made better. Yep, exactly. So, so for a woman to say, I'm going to trust God with my husband to make him the man he wants him to be is a huge step of faith for her. Yes. Just like it's a huge step of faith for us men that if I love my wife and take care of her heart, she will want to give me her body. Yes. Both of those are steps of faith that we take, and they're both difficult. So in fairness to women, like this is their tenacious drive that they have to work with. And every one of us could be better. So if our wife wants to focus on it, she can find plenty of material. Yeah, it's just, it's amazing how... I mean, the women I work with, my wife, how tenacious they are. It's impressive and how yes. their brains think. Yeah. It's just so different than me. So let's, let's go back to the brain thing a little bit. Okay. So it's important for women to realize that when, when my wife asks me or my mom asks me or my sister asks me, what am I thinking? I say nothing that they need to let it be. So now let's flip that coin a little bit. I walk into the house. Uh, my wife is clearly upset about something. And I asked her, honey, uh, what are you thinking about? And she says nothing. So help us dumb guys interpret that. As a man, you should never ask the question, what are you thinking? Unless you're prepared to give at least 30 minutes to the answer. <laughs> I would I say, say one at, hour. <laughs> yeah, I say at least 30 minutes because that would be a good day. So yeah. when you ask the question, gear up because you're you're about to go into a, a, a hefty conversation. And second thing I would say, it's probably going to take three attempts to get the engine to start. Oh. You know, first time she's going to say nothing. Gonna go, no, no, honey, really. I can tell something's up. What's going on? You either will get a second nothing or it's just been a hard day. Third time you ask, it's say, so really, it's been a hard day. I really do want to hear. The floodgates open and we're off and running. And she's going to tell you way more than you wanted to hear. Because if, if she's upset enough to say nothing, it means there's 15 or 20 things all piled together that she needs to unravel. And you just volunteered to help her unravel. So... So if you're going to ask the question, give it the time and then just be amazed. But don't try to understand how it's all connected and how it all fits together. Just be amazed that she can do it. And the other thing I would tell men, as you're rolling through this, our wives really are good at this. and We don't give them enough credit. If she needs help, she will ask. You don't have to figure it out. So if she's just talking, talking, just listen Go on the journey, and if she says, can you give me your input on this, or can you help me with this, then go into motion and be the problem-solving hero that you want to be. If she doesn't ask you that, it was just a walk. Yeah, the moment you say, what are you thinking, and she says nothing, you've just put yourself on the outside rim of the plate, right? Yes, yes you have. Yeah, I mean, no, that's <laughs> I love that analogy because – I mean, I think as men, is we should actually volunteer for that spot every day. Hey, let's get on the outside of the plate. Let's take a walk and, and help me understand. So, okay, so let's go back to the waffle now. Okay. Okay. So now men are waffles. So we have all these compartments, and I already know what you're going to say here. So I'm, set, I'm putting the ball on the tee, Bill. Okay. Are all boxes the same size and in this – and or are there any boxes that are more central and maybe larger when it comes to a man's waffle? Of course. I, I would say every man has five or six primary boxes. Okay. And those are the ones where he builds trust. Like all of us, men, we have five or six areas of life that are really important to us. And if I can trust you with those five or six areas, the rest of it, we can work with. 
So I mean, there's five or six areas that are priority boxes. Mm-hmm. The, cool. There's other boxes that th- they could have a lot in it, but as men, we haven't developed them. So they're just like sitting dormant. And then there's some, you, you know how like in a round waffle, you get on the edge and there's little, those little tiny triangles. Like there are yeah, some little- of those where we're like, yeah, I could show a little bit of interest in that, but we'll get through it quick. Yeah. <laughs> there's not much going yeah. on there. So here's a question <laughs> for you then. So, so you, you, you mentioned sex a little bit. So men and women approach sex differently. Uh, that's a quote from your book. And you mm-hmm. said, and there's nothing that we can do about it. So where is the sex box on the man's waffle and how large is that sex box? Well, the sex box is kind of like the free square in the middle of a bingo card. Like it's sitting right in the middle of the waffle <laughs> and we can pretty much get there from every square on the waffle. Like uh-huh. we can jump over <laughs> yes. other ones and get in there. <laughs> that is so true. Oh. And, 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 you know, I, I would just say to all the men out there and any ladies that are listening, like we are interested in our wives. Like God just wired us that when we see them, we are interested. Like it's not as complicated as our wives think it is. You know, if we had a hard day, we're still interested. If you're not looking your best, we're still interested. If you look your best, we're interested. If you're doing something mundane, we're interested. If you're doing something, you know, fancy, we're interested. So like anytime you turn the switch and say, you know, we're clear for landing, we're we're good. It's it's just how God wired us. Now, hopefully we mature and that thought doesn't run our whole life. Correct. But God did give us a natural interest in our wives. And we can get to that interest very, very easily. Yeah. And so, you know, as men, we're required to do more because God wants us all to be selfless. So he created a process where we have to love our wives and we have to pursue our wives and we have to continually build them up and build up their value. But for the women, if you just, all you got to do is turn the light on, we're there. Yeah. Or turn the light off and we're there, however you, yeah. <laughs> whatever your preference is. Well, to, to use your food analogy, men are like a microwave and a woman's like a crock pot. Exactly. So, but well, that's a different episode. But, you know, it's interesting, <laughs> Bill. I have more notes from this book than any book that I've interviewed wow. yet. And I've done over 300 interviews. So okay. I know I'm not going to get through this. But I do want to, we're talking about this waffles versus spaghetti theme. So I do want to address five differences between men and women, because that's kind of what we're doing today uh, that are in your book. And I'll let you highlight those because I want to make sure we get through this on time and and all that. So let's talk about these five differences that you outline your book. And the first one is you've alluded to this a little bit, but you said this uh, uh, regarding a man's brain versus a woman's brain. You said on average, Male brains are approximately 10% larger than female brains. The female brain, however, has four times as many brain cells connecting the right and left side of the brain. This is amazing. And Mm -hmm. I know you unpacked a little bit of that. What else does this mean? Well, probably most important for us men, our wives have better memories about events that happen than we do. Because the way to enhance a memory in life is to connect it to an emotion. Oh. And our wives naturally do that because, again, the two sides of their brain are, are just connected in an incredibly intricate way. So every thought they have is connected to an emotion. Every emotion they have is connected to a, an event. And that's why our wives can remember things at a, a much more detailed level than we can. And more likely, your wife's um, memory of the event is probably a little more accurate than yours. It doesn't mean she remembers it 100% complete, but it's vivid for her. Like, I'm always amazed when we talk about, um, hey, you remember these people that we met? And I'm like, I'm I'm trying to access it. And she goes, you remember he was wearing jeans and a a blue sweatshirt. And she was wearing those black leggings with the, it was like a bright pink. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You remember what they were wearing? (laughs) Because for her, it's this emotional experience. And the other The other big implication that we have a hard time seeing as a gift is this connection in the brain creates a different awareness of life. So our wives can sense when something's not right. Yes, that's true. It's like if something's not right in a relationship or in the family or if something's not right in a friendship, they just they pick it up. Now, that doesn't mean they can voice it. Like they may not be able to say, hey, what I sense is da 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 da. They just... It's like the alarm goes off 
And in ideal situation, as men, we'll respect when the alarm goes off. We'll bring our problem-solving skills into the discussion, and we'll figure out the real issue. Because when men and women figure out the real issue, they're really good at coming up with solutions. The problem is we react to them rather than solve together. But our wives really do have almost a superpower where they can sense when something is not right because they take in all that stimulus and it connects both sides and they're like, something's up. Yeah, yeah. And so they'll bring stuff up. And as men, we we listen to the content too much. We think the first thing she said is what's really going on. Where in reality, it's just the alarm going off. If we can train ourselves to, okay, there's noise. So what's really going on? Because if we figure out what's really going on, like men and women just drop into a groove and they figure out what to do with it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know what's going on and you're trying to solve it, then then you're just you're throwing darts at a board in the dark, mm -hmm. hoping they hit something. So I, you know, I'm a visual learner. So do we connect our memories to a picture? As you mean as men? Yeah. Uh, it depends on which side the memory is on. Okay. If we're on the creative side of the brain, we'll connect it to a picture. If we're on the rational side of the brain, we will connect it to a principle or to a thought. So often men will be able to spout a Bible verse. And yeah. they'll be able to tell you the principle. And then if you ask them, well, how does it apply in life? They go, hey, I got to think about that. Because the application takes a little more work. Yeah. Where women will say, well, yeah, we read that. And that means we got to say this to our kids and this to our grandkids. We got to treat our friends like that. Yeah, I, I, I'm just so impressed. <laughs> My wife can recall things in 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 high vis color, and she can recall, like when I'll, my wife will say, "How'd the podcast go with Bill today? Good. What'd you talk about? Men are like waffles, women are like spaghetti. Oh, okay. What else? Yeah, you have to listen to the episode because I don't know. But my <laughs> wife can give me verbatim about a conversation. I don't know how they do it. Yes. <laughs> and she'll even say, and and you should have seen the look on Bill's face. You know, I, I he must have had fun with his grandkids today because they're, 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 how'd you pick uh, yeah. that up? <laughs> Man, I'll tell you what, it's a lot easier just walking from the outside of the spaghetti plate. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I just I, I, it's now, just so it's so impressive to me. Well, that, now let me talk about one of the advantages men have. Yes. Most men can go to sleep faster than women can. I, I can see why. I know why. Yeah. We, we just don't have as much to unplug. Yes. You know, our, our wives have to unplug all of that activity and calm it down before they can go to sleep. So it's more common for women to have to have a, actually a routine to wind down at night. And it's, it's not a hundred percent, but most men, you know, you feed them something good and put them in the right position on the couch and they're out. Well, you know, it's funny, but like last night, I haven't seen my wife for many days because of my speaking schedule and her work schedule. Yeah. She came home last night uh, and I had a men's event I was at speaking at. And when I came home and I put my hand on her hip, she said, I slept better than I've slept in weeks because that hand on her hip said, this is not a hotel on a layover. You are safe yeah. here. Right. Yeah. And it yeah. just, it just released all of that connectedness. Yes, and so and I think as women there is a deep <laughs> desire. Uh, Dave Ramsey calls it a security gland. A woman wants to feel safe and secure, no doubt, in her in her environment. Yeah. All right. So hey, so so Bill, this fourth thing I want to talk about was a little bit more obscure to me. It's in your book. You said on average, women synthesize the chemical serotonin at a lower level than men. Currently, serotonin is a popular drug target because it has been implicated in a number of diseases, including depression. So serotonin is a it's a neurotransmitter yeah. that uh, yeah. helps relay messages. So so how does that how our differences in synthesizing serotonin, how does that affect us in the context of relationship? So in, in just a pure physical sense, men tend to like, like have a happier approach to life. And they tend to have a more lighthearted approach to life because they they synthesize serotonin, which will actually calm them down, will give this kind of sense of, of life is funny and life is enjoyable. So, you know, you get together with a group of men and we start bantering, we start telling jokes. Sometimes they're really dumb jokes and we laugh and we can find the humor in a lot of things in life. And our wives, they don't they, they don't synthesize serotonin as well as we do. So they tend to carry the emotion of life 
and it's harder for them to release it. So, wow. so like when they experience something that's happy, they can feel the joy. But if they feel something painful, it just sits on them. And then if they hear sad news, it will sit on them. And it, it's why like if, if a man and woman hears a news report, the, the woman will say, that is so sad. That's got to be so difficult on them. And the man will say, man, bad day. And then he kind of moves on. It, yep. It's because women take on all of that emotion, but they don't synthesize serotonin as well enough to, re, to kind of let it wash out of their system. And so for women experiencing joy on a regular basis, it's much more of a choice than it is for men. Like as men, we will, we have the ability to just move to a different box. It's a lot more fun to yes. be in. yes. Where our wives have to, they have to integrate joy into what they're doing. So like when my wife speaks to women's groups, she talks about the importance of choosing joy. And she walks them through some physical experiences to help them like, like get their body trained to feel the joy that they want to feel in their heart. And if I did the same thing in a men's event, they'd run me out of the stadium, right? Make everybody look too silly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, so one of our, as men, one of our prayers for our wives and our daughters is that they connect to the joy that God can bring to our lives and that they integrate it into their thinking process and their decision-making process. Because the, the, the thing I've since learned since we wrote the book is emotions always follow decisions. Mm -hmm. So if we can help our wives and train our daughters to choose to see the good in things and to choose to see the joy that God brings, their emotions will follow those decisions and it supplements what we do naturally by processing all this serotonin in our system. So do men smile more than women generally then? Uh, like in, in the course of life, yes. Okay. To specific events, not necessarily. Okay. Like, like if a woman sees a baby, she's smiling immediately. Yes, yes. Where men... Men might smile if it's their if it's their child or their grandchild, they're smiling immediately. If it's somebody else's, they're thinking, huh, I wonder if my kids look better than this one. Yeah, uh-huh. I hear you. <laughs> so so in specific situations, no, but in general, men smile more than women do. Yeah, well, that makes sense because they're they're experiencing life on a I, I hate to say this for men to I'm gonna get responses from men now, but they experience sure. life on a deeper, more guttural level, maybe. Um, I, I, I don't know that that's necessarily true. Okay. I, I would say they experience life at a more relational level. Okay. Like, like when a woman connects to something, it's a new relationship. Yes. So like, 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 let's say you and I go to a sporting event, we're going to watch the sporting event and we will yell and scream and have a good time. We won't go home thinking that we just made a new friend with somebody that's on the court. Now, our wives might go and say, who's that person? And they will connect with somebody on the court, and that, that person becomes part of their experience in life. And they'll read up on that person. They'll want to hear, like, special interest stories about that person. And we're like, they're just an athlete. Well, but I'll tell you what, for a man who wants his wife to enjoy sports with him, the best thing he can do is tell her the story of each player. Yes. I mean, when she can connect yeah. with his story – yeah. Now there's a sports fan and he's, and men want to have a companion, right? Yeah. So that's, so let's, yeah. so here's one, here's a question. So these back to these compartments that the, these waffle, uh, uh, compartments. So yeah, men seem to spend their money on those, those, those compartments where those, uh, what'd you call them? Easy compartments, yeah, the, the, the easy boxes where they can reach the boxes, but it seems that women spend their money on relationships and security and and when i mean security i mean their own security clothes makeup hair products why is that so so again if we uh think in terms of men are always on an adventure yes and women are always trying to make things better so it gets down to the budget like like you and i we will spend money to make sure we feel the adventure in our soul so, so whatever that adventure is for you and, and, you know, every man, they can, you can feel it in your gut. So for some men, 
like working with technology is adventurous for them. And they're trying to overcome all the obstacles in the tech world. For other men, it's like, whatever. Some men, sports is, is that way. Some men, hunting is that way. For some men, cars are that way. For some men, theology is that way. And whatever ignites that adventure in our soul, we are going to invest in. Yeah. Because a man who doesn't have an adventure feels empty. True. And he will either get bored or angry. Yep. So men will spend money to make sure I can do the adventure. Women, on the other hand, whatever they're involved in needs to be better. So every relationship needs to be better. The home needs to be better. The My parents needs to be better. The wardrobe needs to be better. The grandkids need to be better. The kids need to be better. Whatever, Whatever's in their heart that needs to be better, they will spend money on. Yes, yes. And if it's in the budget, then it's easy. If it's not in the budget, they're probably going to spend it anyway. <laughs> because yeah. these are guttural needs. Like for men, having an adventure is a guttural need for him. Yep. And, sure. and it's very biblical. You know, the first thing God told Adam, I want you to go into this garden I made. I want you to just subdue it. Yep. And then you look at Abraham. Okay, hey, look, I want you to leave your family. And I want you to pack up your wife, your kids, your life, and go. Okay, where are we going? I'll show you. Well, who's going to tell Sarah? You tell Sarah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to tell her. It'll be the land I will show you. <laughs> <laughs> so men are always called to an adventure. Yeah, yeah. But women are driven to make things better. Yeah. So those two things... They show up everywhere, including our budget. So, so Bill, I got to tell you, man, I have so many more notes <laughs> and things I want to ask you, but all I'm going to tell this, tell the guys is this guys, this is a book you have to have in your library. If you're a guy who cares about marriage, you need your marriage. You really need to get this resource. Is this book on a lot of our guys are driving back and forth. Can they access this book through audible? Yes. Okay. So yes. what's the best way for our guy to pick up men are like waffles, women are like spaghetti? Well, the, the fastest way to get it is go to one of the online retailers. Okay. So like you get through Walmart, Barnes & Noble, uh, Amazon, Christian Books, or you can go to our website, love-wise.com. And if you can't remember any of that, just do an internet search on waffles and spaghetti. Like Nobody else is putting those two together, so you'll find us on the front page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, and then I, your, your book, Red Hot Monogamy, is also just a, a game changer. So, guys, hey, we want to get some boots on the ground. So, guys, what are you going to do to make this podcast a part of your life? And here's what I'm going to say. I, I didn't think about this till the interview, but here's what I want you to do. I'm not a pirate. I'm not telling you to walk the plank. I'm telling you to walk the plate. Nice. Walk the plate. See that outside <laughs> the plate and go for a walk with your wife around the plate. Hey, listen, don't tell her you're doing it. <laughs> Don't just tell do her it. you're doing it. Just yeah. do it. Just do it. <laughs> oh, Bill, it is a, a great having you on the show, man. Thank you so much for all you bring to the table. And uh, man, we sure appreciate the time with it. It's been precious. Thanks, Jim. Just keep the men moving because when men move, the whole society gets better. You know it, brother. Have a great day, man. Thank you. Yep. Hey, guys, our man laws are supplied by you, our heroes. And guys, remember, when we use yours, and you hit us up at info at manlarena.org. We will send you some swag when you give us your physical address. This man law is man law number 14 in my new book, Man Laws, 100 Ways to Get Your Man Card Revoked and Rules to Live By. And this man law is simply this. Men do not use diaries. The life rule for this man law is men practice the art of daily journaling. If you just look behind me right here, I've got ro a row of about 40 journals that I have filled over the course of the last 35 years, but I promise you guys, they are not diaries. <laughs> hey guys, make sure you head on over to meninarena.org, grab your copy of my book, Man Laws. Man, you are going to love this book, guys. Until next time, feel the wet sand on the arena floor. Hear the deafening roar of the crowd. Taste the sweetness of victory. Smell the stench of battle. Get in the game. Get dirty. Grind it out. And... Be a man.